And today's show is going to blow your mind. Now, these are the kind of shows that I love doing because this should help increase your faith many fold. Because today we're going to talk about a scientific fact. A scientific fact that was not discovered until thousands of years after it appeared in the Bible. Now, what is this scientific fact? Well, the nutritional content of the grain wheat compared to the nutritional content of a tear or a weed. One, which is the wheat, is iron dominant and the other is copper dominant. The red bloods versus the blue bloods. Now, nutritional content in foods was only discovered in the last hundred years. This is when they discovered that foods had vitamins in them. This was in 1910. And then the other essential elements, they didn't discover till long after that. So, how did the biblical authors know about this thousands of years ago when these things were written down? Well, of course, we know how they knew. It was the inspiration of the Most High. Let's read what the Word says about the wheat and the tares, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And then we're going to look at the scientific evidence of what I found with just a little bit of digging into this. Now, before we get into the Word, here is the history of nutritional science. Because I always get naysayers sometimes that want to talk about the ancient Egyptians and what they knew and all this, which they were actually knockoffs of the truth. The ancient Egyptians, they stole truths and then they tried to make them their own. But here you see the era of vitamin discovery, vitamins and nutrients didn't happen until the 1910s to the 1950s. Now I'll put links to all this in the pinned comment so you guys can see this for yourself and see what is going on with the wheats and the tares. Now let's get back to the parable of the wheat and the tares and read about this. The parable of the sower. It says here, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understand it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receive it. Yeah. Yet hath he not root himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Now, this is in the King James Version. I use the King James when I can. But this is an instance where I believe the King James works against sometimes people's understanding of the Bible. And I believe that was done intentionally by the enemy for us all to say beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're only going to use the King James. Well, what better way to put up a wall between God and his people than to make the Bible hard to understand with the King James Version? You have to read between the lines with this stuff. And sometimes it's okay to use other versions as long as the meaning, the root meaning of the verse is not lost. And it's up to you to do your due diligence through concordance to make sure that the meaning is not lost by switching virgin, virgins. Now, let's keep reading here. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth, because of the word by and by, he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understand it, which is also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some as a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Another parable put he forth unto him, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So this is the parable that we're going to focus on here. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? So he's like, where did these tares come from? Didn't you sow good seed? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. 
The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then go and gather them up? Now understand that this uh, sowing in of the enemy happened at the very beginning in the garden. This is what it's really talking about. Not to say that, you know, people can't be saved if they're of the tares. But in essence, you have to come to Jesus to be saved. All of us do. But Jesus came to give a chance to all. As long as you repent, believe in him, and follow the rest of the gospel. Right? So, here, this person is talking to him about, you know, what happens with, you know, with these tares growing up amongst the wheat. And he said to him, lest while you gather up the tares, you'll root up also the wheat with them. So you can't pull the tares up yet because they're mixed in with the wheat. Now, I believe this is what the Bible is really saying here is that this is a bloodline thing that the, the, the human race has been corrupted by this bloodline. And this is why Jesus had to come because this was a blood issue. That's why Jesus um, had to give his blood in order to save us. Let's keep watching here. Let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest. I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So there is the wheat and the tares. Now let's dig deeper because I wanted to, I have a, a, a side of my mind that I like to see other additional proof. In other words, confirmations, not proof is proof is probably a bad word, but confirmations of the things of the Bible because it would make sense, right? The Bible was built out of the same reality that we live in now. So why wouldn't there be scientific proofs that support the Bible that we could then use to counter the enemy and his accusations and his attacks, right? Let me make sure you guys are with me and then we'll get into the next part of this. It appears as though you guys are very good. Let's keep reading this here because we all know, let's see, where is it here? Oh, here it is. We all know what wheat is, right? We all, we all can identify wheat. It hasn't changed form and since the beginning of time. But the Bible is not really specific as to what kind of weed that, or what kind of tear it is speaking of when referring to these, wheat, these tares, right? What kind of weed it is. Because obviously it's a weed, but we don't know which one it is. Well... Here's an article here that seems to narrow down what species of weed that the tares are. And it narrows it down, I think, pretty accurately. We're going to read this article. It's called Zawan and the Tares in the Bible. Cephalaria syriaca, one of the candidates for tares in the wheat field near Madaba, Jordan. And in the abstract, it says here, Zawan and tares in the Bible. Syria refers to two weeds in wheat fields as Zawan in Arabic. These are the sedgital weeds, Cephalaria syriaca and Lolium temen, temel luntum. The Greek word zazanion in the parable in Matthew 13 is translated variously as tares, darnel, and weed. According to the biblical text, Tares must have a life cycle like wheat and easily contaminate wheat seeds. You better understand which plant which plant is Zawan field and threshing. Oh, Zawan field and threshing sites in Jordan and Syria were surveyed. Four grain fields and four threshing sites had cephalaria. One field and one threshing site had lolium. So these are likely the two types of tares mentioned in the Bible. Now, let's read this here. It says two major grains are mentioned frequently, both in the Old Testament of the Bible. Wheat was preferred grain because it could be used to make yeast bread. Barley, on the other hand, lacks appreciable gluten, so produce less desirable flat bread. For that reason, barley was consistently valued at half the price of wheat. The parable of the wheat and the tares is well known. Despite this, there is disagreement over the plant or plants meant by the Greek word zazanion. Found only in Matthew 13, where it, is, where it is variously translated into English as weed, darnel, or tares. In order to understand the context and its botanical features, it is essential to consider the text in detail. Jesus told them another parable. So here it talks about the parable that we just read. And 
Tares are associated with wheat, not barley. Tares could be contaminants of wheat seed. This is implied in the seed being good. Following on this, the grains of the two must be similar. Modern varieties of wheat can reasonably be assumed to have larger grains than ancient wheats, obfuscating the mimicry of the two different fruits. Life cycle of the tares and the wheat is synchronous. Let both grow together. The farmer struck the workers to first gather and bind the tares, first collect the weeds. The fact that the wheat may be collected or damaged does not imply that the root system of the tares is more entwined with the neighboring roots. So they're doing an analysis here to try to narrow down what these wheats and tares are. At least near maturity, the two plants could be distinguished in the field because the wheat was forming ears when the tares were discovered. No mention of the tares being poisonous. There's a well-known proverb which also deals with weed in wheat. This plant or guild of plants is Zawan in Arabic. The proverb states, the Zawan of your own country is better than the wheat of strangers. So here are the candidates for tares and Zawan. Weeds are mentioned in many places in the Bible. Few of those are associated with wheat, however. There is a reference in Job, let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. The Hebrew word here is bashal, also found in Isaiah 5, where it is translated as wild grapes. So this goes on. And then they talk about a long history of this El Temeltumum, which is Darnell. We're going to look at Darnell. We're also going to look at the Cephalaria. But let's go back to the Darnell. It is, a visu it is visually indistinguishable from wheat, at least at the younger stages. It matures at the same time as wheat. The mature grain are about the same size and shape as wheat grains. Because they are non-shattering, the darnel are carried intact when the grain is harvested. And they are often uh, toxic and known to poison cattle. A classic paper identifies a fungus as the toxic principle. These two factors, being a grass and being toxic, made lolium or darnel a fitting plant for tares. Nevertheless, the parable does not require that tares be toxic, nor does it imply that wheat and tares must be distinguishable when very young. So on the basis of toxicity and mimicry, many modern students of the Bible have accepted lolium as the tares or the darnel as the tares. On the other hand, there are records of numerous uh, darnel grains as contaminants in grain caches in Israel in that country can't even say that country on youtube anymore unbelievable so basically they found this stuff in these ancient caches i'm not going to read this whole article because it's kind of long but another strong prospect for zawan and another possibility for tares is cephalaria syriaca the growth form of cephalaria is much different from wheat after a single stem reaches approximately the same height as a wheat plant it produces four branches at sharp right angles uh, cephalaria is not toxic and is one of the most successful weeds in wheat fields in the Mideast because of its stature, phenology, retention of fruits, and the resemblance of the fruit to wheat. So, then they talk, there's a study they show here of why these two sh could be the actual candidates for both of these. Now, let's get into these, break these down now that you know what we're dealing with here. And so the article identifies these two weeds that could be strong candidates for what the, the Bible describes as tares. Darnell ryegrass, which is lolium temelemptum, and the uh, cephalaria. Now, the cephalaria is also known as Syrian cephalaria, as you can see here. And so I found the nutritional content of both of these weeds compared to wheat. And here is what I found. We're going to start with the Darnell ryegrass tear, and we're going to compare that to wheat. So here is the Darnell ryegrass. Now these are just leaf samples. So it's going to be much different than the grain. But look at this. 
Darnell has about 15% more copper. Here's copper down here at the bottom. And as you can see, the wheat has 8.17 and Darnell ryegrass has 9.23. This is milligrams per kilogram. But as you can see, that's about 15% more copper than wheat just in the leaves. So you can imagine the difference in the actual grain. But look at this other tear, cephalaria. Now, as I told you, uh, the cephalaria is the actual, let's see, where did I put that? The cephalaria is also called Syrian cephalaria. So they're, they're one and the same. But if you look at the cephalaria, if I can find where I put that. The control, the, uh, the control group actually shows a much higher content. I think this is it here. Got to scroll down. Here it is. Of copper. And it's right down here. Here it is. Okay. So, let's zoom this up. As you can see, this is a Syrian cephalaria, as you can see at the top of your screen there. I like that up for you. And... The control group down here has no, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Fertilizer in it. This is a fertilizer study. So the control group has no fertilizer. So we're looking at this line right here. And as you can see, they've got the copper in this column. Let's make this so you guys can see this. The copper in this column and iron in this column. But look at the copper content in the same measure, which is milligrams per kilogram. Almost triple the copper content in the cephalaria tear compared to wheat. Remember, wheat was 8.17, about 8. And the tear, which is the cephalaria, is three times that amount at 23. Triple the copper content. Now, what you're going to notice here is both have pretty high iron content. What we're looking for is the dominant mineral, okay? Because both the Darnell and the Cephalaria tares have a lot more iron than the wheat. But since both have toxic levels of copper in them, they could never be used as a food source, could they? Now, there is one animal that loves the weeds, what animal do you think that is? That would be goats. Goats actually love the high copper content. And in fact, here's one article from Hogger Farmyard. And they talk about pasture weeds as mineral sources for goats. They talk about copper deficiency in goats. And that they can actually eat these types of tears unbelievable now this one mentions a variety of weeds that they can eat but i think in here they actually show the specific weed that we're looking at that they're able to eat this particular weed let me scroll through this article here was it the darnell let's do a search on this page or was it the ryegrass? All right. So the ryegrass is mentioned here as a, a potential for, you know, these goats to eat in order to not have a short, you know, a, a, uh, a deficiency in this kind of thing. It says here, the copper concentrations found in ragweed, chicory, and Jerusalem artichoke are high sources of copper now here's where things get very very interesting because goats love the dominant copper in the weeds but sheep cannot tolerate it now We'll get into that in, in the sheep and copper 
and what it does to sheep. But first, I believe there's a third candidate. So we had the Darnell, we had the Cephalaria, but I think there's a third candidate for a possible tear. And it's not mentioned in the analysis that we just looked at, but I think this may be the one, and it is ragweed. It has the highest copper content of almost any weed. Now, they mention that in this article here. Let's take a look here. The highest concentrations are found in the ragweed, as it says right here. The highest concentrations of copper. And so this is a possible, this is a possible, um, you know, possibility that this could be one of the weeds of the tares mentioned in the Bible. And ragweed does, in fact, appear in wheat fields. As you can see here, it says managing giant ragweed and meristol in wheat. Giant ragweed are examples of weeds that emerge in wheat. While they may sometimes interfere with wheat harvests, the greatest concern is their impact on double crop soybeans following wheat harvest. It's difficult to control. That's meristol that's difficult to control. So we see the two growing together now this is also a problem gosh got so many tabs pulled up it's hard to like pinpoint the tab i'm trying to get to this is also a problem with in this country can't say the country but here you go you have the country they grow a lot of wheat there which would be like the holy land which is probably where the parable originated because that's where Jesus was when he told the parable, right? So, it's a real problem. Let's keep going with this. Now, where are we at? Let's get on the right tab here. There we go. Okay. So this is a problem in the Mideast. And ragweed, interestingly, also goes by another name. Ambrosia is what ragweed is called. Now, we all have heard that before because it's the name also given as the drink of the gods. Yes, ambrosia is the drink of the gods. Why would the drink of the gods also be named the tear or the ragweed? This is why I think radweed, ragweed could be the biblical tear as well, a third candidate. Now that we've talked about copper in the weeds, what about iron? What about iron? Well, iron, of course, is the main component in human blood, right? Iron-based blood, hemoglobin. And we know that copper is the major component in blue blood, hemocyanin. Two are very different. Well, in wheat, according to Wikipedia, iron content in wheat is gets you about 25% of the recommended daily value. It's between 17 and 25%, depending on the strain which is about three to five milligrams per 100 milligrams. So as you can see here, the wheat or the iron is, uh, or the wheat is iron dominant. In other words, you can eat a lot more wheat without getting a copper deficiency because both the wheat and the tares have iron, but the wheat is far less toxic in terms of the copper. We call it the copper to iron ratio is much better in the wheat. Okay, so this is the wheat nutritional value. So now we're starting to see things shape up, right? The enmity between the seeds. Why would God call it seeds? Because this is all about plants. Why not call it an enmity between the bloodlines? Why wasn't that the first prophecy in the Bible? Right? Here's another study showing the iron content in wheat. And they say it's from 2.90 to 5 
milligrams per 100 grams. Just to give you another backup source. Some people don't like it when I use Wikipedia. Now, what else is going on here where we could further shake this out and support this with, you know, factual evidence? Well, copper directly affects iron uptake. In other words, copper is at enmity between with iron. It competes with iron. Let's read this. This is out of ProMix. Excess copper in the growing medium can restrict root growth by burning the root tips and thereby causing excess lateral root growth. High levels of copper can compete with plant uptake of iron and sometimes molybdenum or zinc. The new growth can become initially greener than normal, then exhibit symptoms of iron deficiency or possibly other micronutrient deficiencies. So, copper is at enmity with iron. The two bloodlines are at enmity with one another. Now, we've all heard the parable of the sheep and the goats, haven't we? And apparently, sheep are very sensitive to copper. Toxic wasting disorders in sheep. Let's find this here. Sheep are very limited in their ability to excrete copper. Indeed, sheep tend to accumulate copper in the liver a long time, thus being extraordinarily susceptible to chronic copper intoxication. You guys, this is game changing. Because when's the last time you went to a sermon and heard the reason why sheep and goats were used in the parables? And this is why you can't just stop at what's in the Bible. It's okay to compare it to real life. Why are the churches not allowing us to do that? Why do they frown on people who want to see the additional connections? It's because they've been taken over by the enemy. That is not the true church. The true church does not shy away from factual evidence, does not run and hide from the contemporary timeline. We embrace it because we know that the Bible is true and real, and it's just sitting there waiting for the connections to be made. Now let's keep reading about this because sheep can actually get toxicity to copper many different ways. Let me make sure you guys are with me as we keep going. I think we are. It can happen one of three ways. Excessive consumption due to contamination of drinking water and or food with copper containing compounds, which would be the weed, the weeds, right? So if your sheep are eating uh, you know, weeds with high copper levels, that's not good. You can also get it from low levels of this certain dietary supplement called molybdenum, which increases the rate of copper absorption in the gut. And they can be exposed to hepatic toxins or their livers could be weak because of eating certain plants, which would cause the uh, copper poisoning. Copper accumulates in hepo, hep, hepatocyte lysosomes, is actively incorporated and stored in new hepatocytes when others die and release it. However, there is a threshold level which the organ cannot cope with the turnover rate and significant hepatocellular necrosis ensues. Subsequently, plasma copper levels increase, causing sudden crisis of intervascular hemolysis, anemia, and death. Sheep may show no clinical abnormalities before the hemolytic crisis occurs, although in certain cases there could be an elevation of hepatic enzymes, such as plasma aspartate transaminase and gamma glutamyl transferase so that's just a word sandwich but basically what they're saying is the liver ruptures from all of the copper copper toxicity now now you're you're starting to see how all of this fits together 
Now, there's a couple more studies in here. Because I found this. The word romaine. Here it is here. This is out of Middle English Compendium. So this is Middle English. The word romaine is associated with blue vitriol, copper, as well as darnel, which they call cockle or the lolium tementulum. The two words are associated together. So there's a direct connection between copper and this weed, which is interesting. There should be no connection, right? Other than the study that we just did. Now here are a couple more articles about Darnell, which is one of the candidates. Wheat's evil twin has been intoxicating humans for centuries. Darnell is poisonous, but in small enough doses can give food a special kick. For many centuries, as long as humans have cultivate, cultivated cereal grains, Wheat's evil twin has insinuated itself into our crops. An evil twin, a doppelganger, the other side of the bloodline. In a big enough dose, the grass darnel can kill a person, and farmers would have to take care to separate it out from their true harvest. Unless they are planning to add darnel to beer or bread or on purpose in order to get high. So there's some kind of toxic effect to the darnel. Darnell occupies a gray area in human agricultural history. It's definitely not good for us. When people eat seeds, they get dizzy, off balance, and nauseous. And its official name, Temel... I gotta say that right. Temeluntum. Temeluntum. Gosh, that's a hard word to say. Comes from the Latin word for drunk. Darnell is a mimic weed. Now, this article screams two bloodlines, doesn't it? It screams it because you got mimicry, you've got doppelganger, you got all these things here. Darnell is a mimic weed, neither entirely tame or quite wild, that looks and behaves so much like wheat that it can't live without human assistance. Darnell seeds are stowaways. The plant survival strategy requires its seeds to be harvested along with those of domesticated grasses stored and replanted next season. So there you go. You can't pull up the tares without pulling up the wheat. And that's why the harvest has to happen at the end of time. Everything's too mixed up right now. Oats and rye began their relationship with humanity in a similar way, but for whatever reason, they were developed into full-on food crops while Darnell stayed in the shadows. The interesting thing about Darnell is that we've caught it in the act. The mimic weed took advantage of humans without fully bending to our will. Darnell has a double life, is a menace and a sought-after intoxicant. They found that Darnell shows up time and again in key literary texts. And remember, Darnell is higher, about 15% higher in copper than the wheat that it grows next to. Once you start looking for Dar Darnell, it's everywhere. Ovid calls it eye blightening. One of the plant's effects is messing with a person's vision and speech. Wow, I wonder how that might tie back in to the Bible. And passages, passages about vision and speech. Hmm. In the Bible, it appears in the parable of the tares. So think about this. Those with eyes to see and ears to hear. Well, they would be free of the tares, wouldn't they? Which cause your vision and speech to be compromised. Wow. So, Darnell shows up in Shakespeare. Lear wears it in, uh, in his crown of weeds. So this, is, this goes back to the crown that we've been talking so much about. Made up of all the idle weeds that grow in the sustaining corn. The symptoms of the king's madness, Thomas noticed, are similar to the symptoms of Darnell poisoning. 
he started wondering if Shakespeare had meant to insinuate that Lear had been eating the plants in his crown. If farmers never domesticated Darnell and were wary of it, people still found ways to use it. In classical Greece, it was known as the plant of frenzy. Thomas and his colleagues found and used in the rites of Demeter and Persephone's followers. It was used in Europe as a medicinal plant, as an anesthetic, and a slow menstrual bleeding. But most often, it seemed to be baked into dazed bread or brewed into beer to give those the those basic an extra kick. Wonder if they if Darnell is in modern beer. That's a good question, right? Maybe somebody can look that up while we're doing the show here and put that into the chat. Is Darnell does it exist in modern beer? Let's keep reading here because this is interesting. It's possible to say how often people used Darnell purposefully for its mind-altering properties and how often Darnell snuck in unannounced and unwanted. In the in the book in his book Bread of Dreams, the Italian scholar Piero argued that European peasantry lived in a state of semi-permanent hallucination from bread adulterated with more malign grains, which they may have sought as an escape from daily life. Certainly, people seem to know what Darnell did and how to use it. It's interesting because here they are talking about these seeds, right? And then the very next parable in the Bible after the parable of the wheat and the tares is the parable of the mustard seed, isn't it? There are sporadic reports of it being out and out cultivated with the express purpose of energizing beer in particular. We had a correspondent on the Isle of Man tell, uh, tell us that it was quite openly cult cultivated there for this purpose. Darnell was grown for its intoxicating properties, though. It likely would have been somewhat analogous to cannabis today. Planted, gathered, and processed under the cover of more acceptable crops or kept secret. Wow. I would love to try it, says Thomas. I have a friend who has a mill. We've discussed the possibility of trying it and seeing what happens. Now, even in doing this show, I'm sure there's some people that are going to run out and try to get high on Darnell. But after what we've read today, is that something you really want to try and do? When he's been associated with the tares? I don't think so. Maybe that's why the Bible tells us to be sober. Darnell still manages to hide among crops in North Africa and parts of Asia. One study found it made up of almost 10% of wheat harvest in Ethiopia. Wow, but modern agricultural techniques have eliminated Darnell from crops in Europe. When Thomas looked recently, he could only find six instances of Darnell growing in the British Isles since 2000. So that's that first article. And again, I'll link that because I know many of you will be interested in that and other articles. Here's one last one that I wanted to show you guys. And then I'll be back in the chat. But this is encyclopedia.com and it talks about the tears. And here it confirms the Darnell, Lilium tameltum weed, which grows among grain, particularly wheat. The grains resemble those of wheat. So it is very difficult to separate them by sifting. As a result, they are sown together with the wheat and grown with it in the field. Wow, sounds exactly like the parable, doesn't it? Darnell flour is poisonous and gives a bitter taste to bread in, with, in which it is mixed. The tares do not harm, do not do no harm to birds, especially to doves. That's interesting. The doves versus the crows. Remember that? In when Noah released the dove and the crow, that was about the two bloodlines. Maybe the Darnell not harming the doves is spiritual. Maybe that's all about once you enter into the spirit, because that's what the dove represented. Maybe that's what this means that you are no longer harmed by these things. Nobody would consciously sow tares in his field, hence the parable in the New Testament about the peasant who sowed good seed in his fields. His enemy came and sowed tares in the midst of the wheat. 
According to the Halakha, wheat and tares do not constitute kilium with one another. And then they talk about the, the Talmud here. And that's about it. Let me go back into the chat here. That pretty much concludes the presentation because I think we just found our tear. And there's a lot of scientific evidence that supports what the Bible already knew thousands of years ago before it was all written, before it was all discovered by science. Now that's just amazing to me. So did anyone find out if there is Darnell and beer or any modern breads? Go ahead and you can put your comment in now so we can all learn today and see what's going on. I can imagine there are certain microbreweries who have intentionally added Darnell after what we just read into their microbrew beers, I can imagine. But let's see if anyone did any... Uh, Any research on that while we did the show? I just read about Darnell's been used in beer before, but having a problem copying that for the, in the link for some reason. Oh, you probably are not. I don't think I have links enabled in the chat here, but um, put it in. Where could you put it? Put it in the comment section, and I'll approve it because links don't go through. I have to go in and approve those. But uh, maybe copy and paste just a bit of what you read into the chat here so that we can all see. Or just tell us if it is being used in beers and which beer it's being used in. All beer has yeast, yes. But does it have this Darnell, this tear, this, this, um, this weed? All right. Someone asked about iron and clay. Now, the iron uh, mixed with watery clay. Well, yeah, I mean, that would be like our blood already has iron in it. But I think they're talking about an additional iron mixing metal in with our bodies. Turn us into batteries. The two shall not cleave, though. The two shall not cleave, it says in the book of Daniel. Pops. Uh, yeah, the hops, but that's different. We're looking for Darnell specifically, and it would be something someone would either need to add specifically, or it, it might have contaminated the wheat that goes into beer. But according to what they're telling us, most of the Darnell's been, you know, done away with in modern farming. So it would have to be an intentional thing added in. That's what we're really looking for. I'll research it after the show as well. Yeah, that's what you do. Just Google search Darnell and beer, and it should pop right up. I'd be interested because it gives, it makes your vision and your hearing. What happens when you when you drink alcohol? You get blurred vision. So I'm, this is why I'm wondering. All right. What is the connection between the color blue and copper? Thank you. Okay, we'll get into that right now because it's a really good question. When copper begins to oxidize, which it does immediately, it turns blue-green. And this is why the Statue of Liberty is blue-green. Well, also, blue-blooded creatures or hemocyanin-based creatures, cyan means blue, they are cold-blooded creatures. And they, usually they live in deep depths of the ocean, like uh, octopus and squid, but they could also live on land, which would be like centipedes, spiders, and scorpions. Those are all blue-blooded creatures. So don't you think it's interesting that scorpions are, going, are mentioned in the book of Revelation as stinging us? That's a blue-blooded creature. Now, their blood actually looks like black, but... It, you can actually see pictures of an actual centipede blood. And actually, when you spread it out, it looks bluish purple almost. It just looks black because it's concentrated. Same thing with um, octopus. Their blood is actually blue. It's not really black. It just looks black. As well as with um, the ink of squid. 
So that's the connection between blue or cyan and copper. The hidden spot. So Darnell means the hidden spot. Maybe that's how the, the tares hide amongst the wheat. And you guys are smart. Tamelentum sounds like tarantula, doesn't it? Which is also a blue-blooded creature, I believe. Bites and stings, says T. Kerr. Horseshoe crabs, yes, they are also blue-blooded. Now, those are also used uh, as experimentally. Okay. So, again, um, hopefully today's show has helped to strengthen your faith in the Bible, in the Word, that it is completely 100% accurate, that there is no way that 2,000 years ago that uh, the writers of the Bible knew the nutritional content in wheat and tares, I mean, on their, you know, of their own cognizance, in other words, of their own knowledge. The knowledge was inspired of God and given to them to write these things down so that now we can be in the last days and look at things from a scientific perspective with the increase in knowledge and compare the two. And it literally legitimizes the Bible. It legitimizes it. As a legitimate parable based in the secrets of creation. Amazing. All right, what else do you guys have? You guys have any other questions before we before we pop off here? Now, tomorrow's show, we're going to be going between the headlines, some updates of things going on. Copper pipes and copper pans. Now, copper has properties in it that actually help to basically kill anything it touches if you're in contact with it long enough. So, it can kill bacteria, things like this. For that reason, the copper IUD was put into the womb because it creates a toxic environment and a mild autoimmune response creates a toxic environment for the, the, for the uh, egg. I'm switching gears here from nutrition to women's health. Um, from, you know, toxic environment for the egg not to be able to implant into the sidewall of the endometrial lining of your uterus. And it basically uh, doesn't even allow, I mean, it'll allow um, conception to occur for the two to meet, the egg and the sperm, but it very quickly becomes toxic to the seed and will not allow it to proliferate in the womb and therefore prevents pregnancy. Interesting that the IUD, the copper IUD, is a copper wire wound around a cross. Is it? We did a full show on that years ago. Now, for those of you that don't know, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 15 years. This is what I did before I came to YouTube, repented of all that, and made a pledge to God to continue to expose the lies of the enemy. And this is why this is what we do here. This is my job, my promise that I made to God. And he said, this is what I want you to do. This is why we do this. I know sometimes it seems like all we do is do this, but for those of you that maybe need encouragement in other areas or praise and worship. There are other arms and other limbs of the body of Christ that do that for you. But God, the job he gave me and made me, I guess, I don't like to say I'm good at it because it's all through God's glory and his grace that he gives us gifts. And 90% of this channel has been all of you and me working together, not just me. But this is the task that he's given me. And it's interesting how my history and what I've done in my life before I repented of it actually has helped to expose the enemy. One of those examples is the IUD. 
in the fact that visually and spiritually it lines up and matches the caduceus. It's the copper snake on the copper pole wrapped around. And what does it do? It goes after the seed of the woman. You can't make this up, you guys. It goes after the seed of the woman. Now, that's on a spiritual level, and the woman putting it in knows that that's what she's doing. But think of the deep spiritual meaning of that. And what pharmaceutical company would actually create something like that? It is like one of the darkest things that you could create. It's like putting a Baphomet in the womb. Or something. Or something with a 666 on it. It's literally almost the same thing. So, mind-blowing. The things that God reveals through all of us on this channel to help other people and their strength to increase in the last days. Okay, do you guys have any other questions? Zoom you guys up here. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Well, I'll see you guys tomorrow with more headlines. I love each and every one of you. And um, if, if you guys do any research and find anything out about Darnell and beer, please put it in the comments. I'll try to be diligent about approving the links so that it can show up in the comment section. And I'll put all the links to this show in the pinned comment right now after the show. I love all of you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Take care and be safe.